life's alphabet has gained another pair of letters. From plankton to people, all organisms store information in their genome with just four chemicals, represented by the letters A, T, C and G. These DNA letters contain instructions for making proteins, and they ensure that our traits are passed on to future generations. But now, a team at the Scripps Research Institute in California have engineered E. coli bacteria to build its DNA with two additional letters, so far rather unhelpfully called 5-6 and NAM. Nature reporter Ewan Calloway spoke to Floyd Romesberg and asked how he and his team bucked billions of years of evolution by adding to DNA's alphabet. The substrates for the synthesis of DNA are just uh, molecules called triphosphates. And so you have a triphosphate for G, C, A, and T that are naturally produced within the cell. Now, a cell won't produce the triphosphates of our unnatural nucleotides, 5, 6, and NAM. So what we had to do is we had to find a way to get them inside the cell. So what we did was we found a protein from an, uh, uh, other organisms that, when expressed in bacteria, recognize the triphosphates of our nucleotides when we add them to the media and facilitate their import into the bacteria. So once we did that, once we had them inside the cell, the absolutely normal replication machinery of E. coli that replicates DNA containing G, C, A, and T recognized our unnatural nucleotides perfectly fine and replicated the base pair with high efficiency and fidelity. So we actually didn't have to do any manipulation of the cell to get them to take the unnatural base pair once we had it inside the cell. So you're saying they're, they've got genes now with not just four DNA letters, but, but six? That's right. That's quite impressive, actually. I, I'm just sitting back and thinking about it. Do these extra letters do anything yet? They don't do anything yet, but that's the most exciting part. So what we've done is we've gotten bacterial cells to store the increased information. So now we're working on retrieving it. The normal steps of information retrieval is you take DNA, transcribe it into RNA, and then you translate the RNA into protein. And so what we're examining right now is the transcription of DNA containing our unnatural base pair into RNA containing the unnatural base pair. And what we'll look at next is translation of the RNA containing the unnatural base pair into proteins containing unnatural amino acids. And adding these foreign base pairs, essentially making, I don't know, this is a poor analogy, but a, a bilingual organism. I mean, do, do the alphabets work together? In, in terms of working together, one of the biggest challenges over the past 15 years of optimizing these unnatural base pairs in my lab was getting them to function within DNA without perturbing the function of DNA. So what we knew from the beginning we wanted to do was be able to simply expand the number of letters that DNA uses to store information without perturbing its ability to handle all the information that it already has. Well, so what we wanted to do is we didn't want to destroy the natural system. We wanted to expand its ability to store information. So calling it a bilingual cell maybe isn't that awful in a metaphor, is it? Well, I mean, it's kind of like if you read a book that was written with four letters. You're not going to be able to tell many interesting stories that way. And if you're simply given more letters, you can invent new words, you can find new ways to use those words, and you can probably tell more interesting stories. Is there any limit to the number of, of foreign letters that, be, that can be integrated into DNA and to extend your metaphor, uh, the number of different stories that can be told? Everyone's very familiar with a normal base pair between GC and AT and the hydrogen bonds, the way those two base, the way that nucleotides within a base pair interact. And I think there was kind of the preconception that those hydrogen bonds were essential for a base pair. And there's only so many ways that you can arrange those hydrogen bonds. So it just didn't look like there were many ways that you could get different base pairs. What my group did was we, we used a force that's completely outside of that used by natural DNA. What, what, what that sort of shows is that there's nothing special about hydrogen bonds within DNA. It's, you, you just have to replace them with a strong and selective force. So there are other forces that one could envision using and maybe designing other unnatural base pairs. But I would also emphasize that right now, having simply one additional unnatural base pair allows for the encoding of proteins containing more unnatural amino acids than we could ever possibly use. Could we or would we ever want to make a life form that, that totally dispensed with conventional nucleotides? Want or be able to are sort of two different things. Um, I, I don't particularly want to. <laughs> so a lot of times a lot of people say, oh, you'll make an organism completely out of your unnatural DNA. That's utterly impossible, and that, that's just not going to happen because there are too many things that recognize DNA and that manipulate it in a cell. It's too integrated into every facet of a cell's life. But what we've done now is we've now created an organism that's not fully unnatural, but it is semi-synthetic and it does have unnatural synthetic components 
that allow you to include more information in DNA than possible with natural systems. 